synthesis, uh, mapping formation pathways for bespoke binaries. So, uh, Erin, uh, take it away. Okay. Um, so, can you hear me? Um, okay. I'm not sure the microphone is on. Is it on? Or, yeah, okay. okay. I'll just hold it then. Um, hi, I'm Heron Cho. I'm a third year grad student working with Ramesh. 
Um, today I'll just talk about the analytical model of state transitions in accreting black holes. First, to set the stage, uh, we know that if there's a gas reservoir near the black hole, it doesn't fall directly in, but it swirls around the black hole several times, which forms an accretion disk, analogous to water draining down the sink. And for the accretion disks, um, there are two main uh, theories. One is co the standard cold thin disk, and the other is hot accretion flow. So for the cold thin disk, if you look at edge on, it will look like this because this is thin. And in, the, uh, in this theory, the energy balance is between viscous heating and radiative cooling. So whenever in my talk, if you see a uh, capital Q, that means it's an energy rate. Um, and Q plus means it's heating, uh, heating rate, and Q minus is cooling rate from radiation. On the other hand, there is a hot accretion flow where I've drawn as pink circles because they are usually characterized by low densities. Um, and because these, are, these have low densities, the radiation cooling is not as efficient because they, the, the radiation cooling scales as density squared. So instead, what's happening is when the accretion is heated up by viscosity, this is not radiated away, but it's um, accreted together with the flow, which we call advection. Observationally, there are also two different types of spectral states. One, I'm showing here one accreting system in the thermal state on the upper panel and hard state in the lower panel. And thermal state is characterized by a very dominant black body spectrum, as you can see in the red curve. And hard state is characterized by a power loss slope, which is shown in blue. And it also extends to very high energies. Um, from these two different types of uh, states, SN et al. in 1997 were successful in explaining, in relating the two observations to two accretion disk theories. So the thermal state could be well explained by uh, a cold thin disk extending all the way to the black hole, and hard state could be well explained by hot accretion flow in, uh, in the vicinity of the black hole. So this is the original paper's figure, um, and as you can see in the hard state, you can see that the cold thin disk does cannot extend all the way to the black hole, but it's truncated at some radius very far from the black hole or black hole's ISCO, and instead, it is occupied by hot accretion flow near the black hole. Now, we were really curious why an accretion system would choose one state or the other, or even why it would transition from one state from other, like thermal to hard or hard to thermal over time, because that was also observed in uh, X-ray binaries. So this became our motivation for our project to understand why the system would change its states. But before I uh, move on to my model, I'd like to mention one more thing, which is the disk corona. So I'm showing here the X-ray black hole binary in a thermal state where the thin disk should exist everywhere up to the black hole's ISCO. But even here in the spectrum, uh, aside from black body curve, you still see some features of very high energy photons. And that hints us to a very the existence of a very hot gas near the thin disk, which we call corona. And uh, this is very debated what the corona should look like, but this is an assumption that I will take throughout this project. So the, in this geometry, the corona, hot corona, is sandwiching the cold thin disk in the mid-plane. So I'll take that approximation. And, um, so starting from that corona geometry, uh, Meyer and Meyer Hoffmeister in 1994 came up with this evaporation model to explain such state transitions. So their story goes like this. So when you have a very cold thin disk in the midplane and hot gas surrounding it above and below, in the interface between the disk and corona, there would be a very steep temperature gradient because the temperature has to rise very steeply from cold to hot. That's going to make a very strong thermal conduction from the hot corona to the cold thin disk, giving a lot of energy from the hot corona. 
And in response to that, the cold gas in the thin disk will gain energy to escape the cold thin disk into the hot corona, which we call evaporation. And imagine the case where this evaporation is significantly strong, such that it depletes all gas in the cold thin disk, then we'll be only left with hot accretion flow at that radius. So that's when the cold thin disk is truncated and only hot flow remains. So that's how they explain a system can go through a state transition from thermal to hard. So we started from this idea and we wanted to make a very simple and analytic approach. So our strategy was to first study the corona um, and get the uh, analytical solutions for corona states such as temperature and surface density as a function radius. And if we understand the corona well, we can uh, now we can then understand how disk and corona interact via evaporation. And if we understand the evaporation, we can then say something about how transition works and how state transition happens. So this is our schematics of a black hole accreting system at hard state. So as you can see near the black hole, it's a hot accretion flow and the thin disk is truncated at the outskirts and corona is surrounding it above and below. Uh, so for hot accretion flow only and thin accretion disk only, there is a very well established theory that has analytical solution as a function of radius, except for the corona where it knows the existence of the thin disk and it's in contact with the thin disk. So that's where we're filling in the gap by solving for the corona state as a function of radius. Um, I cannot show all the equations, but we uh, started off from non-relativistic hydro equations and divided into two regimes because in order to get analytical solutions, we had to make certain approximations. So one regime could be where this conduction energy from the corona to the thin disk can be all radiated away. That would be our first regime. And the second regime would be where the conducted energy all gets used up to evaporate mass from the thin disk to the corona. So if we divide into two different regimes, we could find the analytical power law solutions, scaling relations for the corona temperature and surface densities. They actually turned out to be uh, some, one regime closer to the black hole, one regime further from the black hole. So this is what the analytical uh, solutions look like at the end. So in the left, I'm showing corona temperature as a function of radius and surface density as a function of radius here. And you can see the clear two power loss uh, behavior with a break. And we can also predict from analytical solutions where this break radius could, would be. Okay, now that we have analytical solutions for the corona for the temperature and surface density solutions, we can now uh, look at what the evaporation rate would be from the disk to the corona. And then we can pull out some conclusions and we can learn something about state transitions. Um, so one thing we found is that at hard state where the disk is truncated, uh, this truncation radius should always be larger than the break radius that we found in the two power laws. And we also found that lower accretion rate always leads to larger truncation radius, which is uh, consistent with the observational trends shown here. So I'm showing an y-axis is related to accretion rate, and x-axis is the truncation radius. And I'm, each dots are different systems. Um, and you can see there's a negative slope, and that's exactly what our model is predicting. Um, I don't have a lot of time to talk about this, but since our model was very simple, we could even add extra physics to it. So not only viscous heating, but we also included heating from magnetic fields, and not only Bramstrahlen cooling, we also added inverse Compton cooling as well. And what we found was that if we include these extra physics, uh, we found that there should be onset of disk wind at the break radius. Um, so I didn't, I couldn't really 
explain all the things that my project did, but please look at the paper if you're interested, and also come to me if you have any questions, since the paper is pretty long. So thank you. There is one corona close to us, which is the corona of the sun. Yeah. So can we learn any lessons from that corona in terms of the heating rate for magnetic reconnection, the kind of things you were talking about at the end, which could be quite important? Yes. So I'm actually um, making a bit of approximation that's inspired by solar corona. Um, and yes, exactly what you said. Um, I'm very looking forward to the, uh, I, ca I cannot remember the name of the, uh, Parker, Parker. Parker, yes. 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 So I'm re very looking forward to that mission such that it gets closer to the sun sense corona and what we can learn from that uh, regarding the magnetic it's heating. It's an amazing probe because it goes really close to yeah. the sun, doesn't melt, yeah. even though it gets to thousands of degrees, I guess. Yeah. yeah, I think that's something that I'm really looking forward to. Like if they have the result, I can apply to my model and maybe change a little bit because Currently, we have a very, very simple prescription for the magnetic heating. So, yeah, that's definitely something that I'm interested in. Yeah, it's good to learn from the sun. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other questions, comments? Yes, please. Um, could you tell us a, little, a bit more about the generalized model? Components yeah, so um, for this generalized model, I didn't have a lot of time to talk about it, so I had a bunch of dip, like extra slides. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So for the generalized model, what I basically did is I added an extra heating term. Um, so it's a very simple prescription, not, um, which is just saying, okay, we don't know how to, how magnetic field will heat the system up, but probably it's proportional to the viscous dissipation in the thin disk. And I introduce a proportional factor, and Yes, and if I do all of these additions, then I, this is what I was talking about. So it's the new solution with all the new physics, uh, temperature as a function of radius. And you can see that compared to the virial temperature shown in dotted lines, now it, the temperature is over super virial, meaning that um, the wind is super necessary, starting off around at the break radius. So yeah, thanks for the question. <laughs> The other, yeah, go ahead. If the corona is not, if the corona is a different geometry, like it's centered around the black hole itself, could we use your models to like try to observationally figure out the geometry? Like, could we see the interactions between the disk and the corona, or to try to identify which models are more correct? Or mm, I guess this won't be applicable to other types of corona geometry, like lamppost or jet based. Um, so I. Yes, for that type of geometries, uh, I'm, currently I'm using non-relativistic prescriptions, but for that I, I would assume that general relativity would be needed if it's a, the corona is the jet base. So probably this is not applicable, but it could be possible that if my solutions are uh, cannot explain the effects that you can observe, probably that's something that can, this model could be excluded. But yeah, thanks for the question. OK, let's thank uh, Harry again. <laughs> I wasn't sure I'm counting on the time. Can you hear me properly? Okay, perfect. 
So hello everyone, my name is Alexia Simon and I'm a fourth year graduate student working in Karin's Oberg Laboratory Group and today I'm going to take you with me into one of my laboratory journey which is going to talk about the entrapment of hypervolatile in interstellar and cometary CO2 and water ice analogs. So here is the planetary system formation pathway, so from the cloud to the denser cloud protostellar stage, then the protoplanetary disk, and then the planetary system. At each of those stages, chemistry is happening, and in the lab we can try to mimic this chemistry at this particular condition. But for today's talk, I'm going to focus on panel D, which is the protoplanetary disk stage, because the mechanism I'm studying is uh, involving volatiles, and we know that volatiles into that stage is highly dependent on the temperature profile set by the newborn star. So planet and planetesimal acquire the volatile through ice and gas accretion into protoplanetary disk around young stars, and the composition of those planets will depend on the distribution of those volatiles in icy grand mantle or in gas within the disk, and those distribution of volatile will depend on the temperature profile in the disk. So from the radial temperature gradient, we expect more and more volatile to freeze out further from the star. And so that will change the solid and gas composition for planet planetesimal formation. We know that most of those ices are present as mixtures. And if they are present as mixtures, there is other factors regulating this um, ice gas division, such as entrapment of more volatile species into less volatile ice matrices. So we have a small sketch with the grain, and around we have the ice mixture. And we can actually do that in the lab. So here's a picture of inside of one of our chamber, where we have the sample holder in gold. And we have this window, which represents the grain. And on top of that window, we can create an ice. And so here is a zoom in of a created ice. Another way to look at entrapment is to look at here a water matrix. And so within this water matrix, we're going to have an hypervolatile, which is in this case uh, nitrogen, into it. So the nitrogen can't escape as long as the matrix is either broken or totally desorbed. So entrapment is important because it's going to allow hypervolatile to be present at higher temperature than previously predicted and so be present in the solid form closer to the star. Um, and so planet and planetesimal composition will have more of those volatile into their solid form and the chemistry distributed within the core of those uh, planetesimal or atmosphere will change than what we thought before. So from previous work done, we know that water can un entrap a range of hypervolatile in either binary mixture or multi-component mixture at different quantities. And from the previous research that I've done, I also noticed that CO2 can actually entrap, in that case, CO volatile uh, even more efficiently than water. And the reasons why I was looking at CO2 is because CO2 is the second most abundant volatile after water in disk and interstellar regions. Okay, so the goal of that research is to better understand this entrapment mechanism. I want to understand if this entrapment is going to be dependent on the ice matrix or on the volatile inside uh, the matrix because too few quantitative data exist to actually make a predictive model. So the goal of that research is to actually realize uh, a quantification of those experiments by looking at two different ice matrices, water and CO2, for a range of four hypervolatile, methane, CO, argon, and nitrogen, at different thicknesses, different mixture ratio, and deposition temperature. And the reason is uh, to be realistic to what we can have in the protoplanetary disk. So now let's talk about doing this experiment. So everything starts within the gas line. So I'm going to have a gas mixture. And this gas mixture is going to enter into the chamber through um, what we call the dozer. And this dozer is going to go inside the chamber. And this gas mixture was directly going to freeze out onto um, the window, which is at really cold temperature of 10 Kelvin. And there is two ways of doing the composition analysis of that ice. We have the infrared, which I'm not going to talk about today and we have the mass spectrometer QMS. Okay, so up to now we have our sample holder with our created ice at 10 Kelvin. And in order to know if uh, I have 
Entrapment, I'm going to warm up that ice at one Kelvin per minute until full desorption of my ice. And so this will be recorded by my QMS, and that will give me what we call a temperature program desorption curve. Here we have two uh, figures, two curves, one for water and CO mixture and one for CO2 CO mixture. There is multiple things to talk about on those plots. So first, uh, focus on the blue lines, which are the ice matrices. We can only observe one peak, which corresponds at the normal temperature desorption of our ice matrix. And in the case of CO, we have multiple peaks. The first peak corresponds to the normal temperature desorption of CO, which is around 40 Kelvin, and we believe that's the quantity which is at the top of the ice. Then we have the last peak, which desorbs at the same temperature as our ice matrix, and that's the quantity which is going to be trapped into, the, into our ice. And so that's the quantity I'm going to measure to create this uh, entrapment efficiency for my research. Finally, in the case of CO2, we can observe this middle peak. This middle peak, uh, we think it happens while the temperature is increasing. We have uh, some desorption of CO during CO2 restructuration, so going from amorphous to crystalline uh, ice matrix. Okay. So now let's build an experiment. So we take one ice with one hypervolatile at one ratio and one thickness. That gives us one experiment. And for the same ice hypervolatile, I can create four conditions. So in total, when doing the other ice and hypervolatile uh, conditions, it gives a total of 32 experiments. I wished. But <laughs> for today, I'm just going to show the 32 best experiments. So I'm directly jumping into the results. So remember this last peak from my TBD curve, that's the quantity I'm going to integrate to actually have on my y-axis uh, my percentage of entrapment. On my x-axis uh, for one matrix, I'm going to consider one volatile at the four different conditions. So on the left we have the CO2 volatile and on the right the water uh, mixtures. Overall, we can see that uh, the highest entrapment happens for the more dilute and thicker ices, and this uh, all range at around 60% entrapment. Another way to plot those results is by doing the comparison between CO2 and water, and overall at each condition, CO2 and water are uh, efficiently trapping those volatiles. And finally, another aspect that we looked at was the deposition temperature. So remember when I had my sample holder with my created ice, I was at 10 Kelvin. Now I'm going to do the deposition at 20 and 30. We don't see any change except in the case of methane into uh, CO2. So the main points to remember from that research is that this entrapment mechanism doesn't seem to be sensitive to um, the ice matrix, since we have uh, observed that CO2 and water entrap those volatiles at the same efficiency, but as well as it doesn't seem dependent on the different hypervolatile that we studied here. And finally, it doesn't seem to be sensitive at temperature below 30 Kelvin, which I would like to precise is a temperature below which the hypervolatile desorb. So finally, more hypervolatile can be trapped uh, into the protoplanetary disk ices than previously uh, predicted. Um, from existing model. So now, from what we know uh, here into that binary research uh, mixture, those ices can be present up to like 60% more abundances closer to the star. And so that can change um, the composition of the forming planetesimal planets. But in order to better understand this mechanism, we have some ongoing work going into the lab where we look at multi-component mixtures, uh, but for the moment Chicha is looking at water, we've directly mixed with the five uh, hypervolatiles. We also look at deposition temperature, which are going to be higher than the hypervolatile desorption temperature, and finally, thicker ices. Thank you so much. <laughs> The outer parts of the Oort cloud, um, there are icy objects that are relic from the formation process of the planets. And uh, every now and then we, we see a long period comet coming from there. Mm -hmm. 
And so the temperature over there could be 10 degrees or, or less than 30. So can we learn anything by looking at the cometary evaporation of this? Yes. Uh, something that complements what you did. Yes, we can totally learn uh, from the abundances that Comet is going to carry, uh, and we can try to make some relation. I don't want to like go too forward, because in that case, it's only binary mixtures, and we know that uh, into those planetesimal uh, comets, it's uh, more complicated. There is more substances. But we can know, obviously, from the outside of the comet, but I think we can have so much more information if we will be able to look uh, into the core of the comet. So in the lab, you can isolate uh, better the physical conditions. Yes. Here, um, so we are at really uh, low pressure. We are 10, at my, uh, 10 to the minus 9 torr and 10 Kelvin. And we can manage this temperature. And we can uh, really manage the mixture that we are choosing uh, to do. So here is like pure binary mixture. So I have only water and one of the volatiles. Uh, so it's a pure entrapment mechanism. Okay, comments? Charles? Uh, thank you, I find this very interesting. Could you give a sense of how long this takes? So what, one of the experiments that you did, how long did it take from the beginning to end? So it takes me one day to do one experiment, approximately. It depends. CO2 desorbs at lower temperature compared to water. So it, I have two hours less than when I do a water one. It does a difference. I can go to bed earlier, which is nice. <laughs> How do you keep it at 10 degrees uh, or 30 degrees? Uh, how do you keep it so, so cold? So we have an old system. Well, I'm might not going to have time. But we have a cryostat on top of our machine. And this cryostat is going to turn around our sample holder. And so the plate will be constantly at 10 Kelvin or at any temperature that we choose to be between 10 and 300. Nice. If anyone feels too hot in the summer, you can visit the lab. <laughs> I wish, but it's actually warmer because we use the pump system and... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Any other questions? If not, let's thank uh, Alex. <laughs>
But over the years, some systems have been found that doesn't fit into the standard picture. And these are what I call evolved CVs, where mass transfer began when the donor was nearing the end of its main sequence lifetime. So that by the time that they're observed, they have degenerate helium cores and thick hydrogen burning envelopes, and they deviate significantly from the donor sequence, which you can see on this plot for a few objects. Um, they are basically unusually hot and bright given their orbital period. These have also been reported to have interesting abundances. In particular, they often show footprints of CNO processing. And um, then there's also been scattered reports of sodium enhancement, which as the title of this talk would suggest, is the focus of my current work. And to put it very simply, um, when we're looking at a single star, we're only seeing its outer layer. So even if it's a little bit more evolved and producing heavier elements, these tend to collect at the core while the lighter elements make up the envelope to form this classic onion-like structure. But if it's in a binary giving some of its envelopes away to a companion, we're going to be able to see deeper into the star where the chemical composition would be different. And these are of interest because they are possible progenitors to a variety of other interesting systems, including extremely low mass or ELM white dwarfs, which I'll be talking a little bit more about next, um, AMCVNs, which are ultra compact binaries, and the white dwarf companion can appear as super soft X ray sources or explode as type 1A supernovae, and so on. Here I show an HR diagram. Um, the dashed line represents the main sequence, and the gray points are the normal CVs. You can, you can see that they follow the regular main sequence track pretty well. And the solid colored lines are various evolutionary tracks depending on um, how um, evolved the donor was when mass transfer started. And what we just want to take away from this plot is that we expect the population of stars to the left of this diagram. And this is where extremely low mass or elm white dwarfs come in, shown in pink. And so um, these are white dwarfs with masses less than about 0.3 solar masses. And to reach such low masses would require such high mass loss rates that they're only thought to form through binary evolution. The majority of the currently known elms uh, was found as part of the elm survey, which was led by Warren Brown here at the CFA. And they used color selection from SCSS photometry. And the complete sample included white dwarfs with surface gravities or log Gs above around 5.5 and effective temperatures above 9,000 kelvins. But what about this empty space in the middle? And this is what the Bartholomew the Elm survey in 2021 looked for. So cooler, more bloated objects that still have ongoing mass transfer or that um, have only recently detached that may be the progenitors of these elms. And so these cannot easily be found by just the color alone because they have similar colors to main sequence stars. So they use the combination of data from Gaia as well as light curve variability um, from ZTF. And they found a total of 51 candidates, 21 of which they obtained spectra for. These have effective temperatures from about 5,000 to 7,000 kelvins. And their orbital period is somewhere between two to six hours. And so as I mentioned previously, um, while there has been scattered reports of sodium enhancement, there's been little systematic study or evolutionary prediction that's been made. So my project was to obtain high resolution spectroscopy of these evolved CV objects from the birth of the ELM survey, calculate their sodium abundances, and run stellar evolutionary models to see um, whether or not they're able to predict the observed abundances. So moving on to actual data from my work finally. Um, we obtained spectra for all 21 objects and uh, looked at the sodium 5900 doublet, otherwise known as the Fraunhofer D lines, and measured the equivalent widths. And we did the same thing for the same line for a model spectra that's been generated over a grid of sodium abundances and essentially just compared them. These are just two of our objects as examples, highlighting the sodium lines and a solar abundance model on top. And these are um, like particularly clear examples, but you can see that the observed spectra has much deeper lines than uh, what is predicted uh, for a solar abundance model. But all objects show some level of enhancement. It ranges from about 0.4 to 1.6 dex by number compared to solar value, with a median value of around 1 dex. So in other words, it's an order of magnitude enhancement, and that's pretty significant. Just quickly mentioning that interstellar absorption lines um, have very little velocity shifts associated with them, and they're also much narrower, so you can kind of distinguish them and get rid of them. And here we can, it visualizes the enhancement of all of the objects. So this is a plot of the equivalent widths against effective temperature. And there's a general downward trend, which is what you'd expect because more of the sodium is getting ionized. And this is the solar abundance model 
and that's what you'd expect for 1.3 dex enhanced model. So you can see that most of the objects lie somewhere in between the two, closer to 1.3 dex line. And so what I'm currently just finishing off is running some MESA models to see the range of initial parameters that result in evolved CVs um, and whether or not they can predict abundances. And so just to be clear, MESA stands for the Modules for Experiment in Stellar Astrophysics. It's this open source one-dimensional stellar evolution code. So for my models, I fixed the white dwarf to be a point mass of 0.7 solar masses, and I tested initial donor masses of one and one and a half solar masses with initially solar abundances. The mass transfer is a fully non-conservative Roche lobe overflow, uh, which just means that all of the mass that's been transferred onto the white dwarf is immediately lost. And importantly, the default nuclear reaction network in MESA doesn't actually track sodium, so we made sure to switch to one that included the neon sodium cycle. And on the right, I show how some of the basic parameters of the donor evolve with orbital period. The main takeaways from this plot is that there's a range of initial orbital periods that results in the, the region's effective temperatures of our objects at their observed orbital periods. For one solar mass, this is about 3 to 3.2 days. For one and a half, it's about 0.7 to 0.8. So it's shorter and narrower for the higher mass, and that's to be expected because more massive stars have thinner convective envelopes, and that's related to a slower rate of angular momentum loss. So that means that the two objects have to be initially closer together. Um, and also more massive stars evolve more quickly off the main sequence. We also see in all of these plots that the more evolved that the donors are, so the darker the color of the lines, they reach shorter periods where they would be observed as AMCVNs. And the last plot is really just showing us that the more evolved that the donor is, the less remaining hydrogen that they have, which is to be expected. And as for the surface abundances, we find that at the observed orbital periods, we expect an enhancement in helium. And this can simply be explained by the fact that we're seeing the core of an evolved donor that's gone through um, a decent amount of hydrogen processing. We also expect to see a deficit in carbon and a little bit of um, deficit in oxygen and an enhancement of nitrogen. And this is typically uh, what is seen for CNO process material. And that's just because the slowest step in the cycle is going from nitrogen to oxygen. And as for sodium, while we do expect to see a significant enhancement, um, it's pretty sensitive to the initial orbital period uh, or equivalently how evolved the donors are. And at one solar mass, um, Donor, we expect a maximum sodium enhancement of about 0.6. And for one and a half, we expect it to be about 0.7. And that's lower than uh, what is seen for the majority of our objects. There are many possible reasons for this discrepancy, one being that the uh, reaction rate from neon-22 uh, proton capture to sodium-23 is known for having a very large uncertainty. And while this doesn't directly translate to an uncertainty in the final abundance, that's something we should keep in mind. And okay, um, of course we could also be overestimating abundances. This could happen if we're underestimating the donor temperatures or not taking into account helium enhancement. So what my models basically show is that while um, we do expect to see significant sodium enhancement in evolved CVs that aren't seen for regular CVs, uh, the models do seem to underpredict it. And yeah, that's it for my talk. Thank you so much for listening. Principle: If you have accretion of planets, you know, in the binary, that could change uh, significantly the abundances uh, on the white dwarf. And we know that there is debris around single white dwarfs and rocky debris that accretes. So, have you seen anything unusual that could indicate a planet that was accreted, a rocky planet? Interesting. Um, I don't think. Uh, so far that there's been like any evidence of something super unusual happening happening otherwise of course there could be contributions from like external things um, but we also don't really see evidence of that which we could see if we follow the spectrum over the entire orbit and saw if there's like some kind of other contribution that's like not the, without the same rate of velocity shift as a donor so it follows this so if it engulfs it maybe something like that could happen but there doesn't seem to be any evidence of external contribution yeah we see it for I mean, people see it for uh, single white walks, but perhaps in binaries as well. So that would be nice to look for. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, other comments, questions? Yeah, go ahead. That was very nice. Thank you. Okay.
Um, so you've got me thinking about the difference between the solar model that you're using here and the sodium one. So these, you know, you can go to know that particular plot is just fine, but just thinking about this perhaps naively because I don't know very much about CVs, is if you have, say, a solar type star in a six hour orbit, then it would be tidally locked and spun up right pretty fast. And so then you might have enhanced stellar activity. In that case, the sodium can be an activity indicator for um, very active stars. So you might even have greater enhancement of the sodium than you're able to account for. That is a really interesting point. Maybe we should talk about that because if it, um, we can explain that there is higher sodium abundance, that's exactly what the kind of thing we would want to explain our observations. So um, yeah, thank you. We, we are um, making sure that uh, it is tidally synchronized, but I don't think that MESA by default accounts for the extra activity that co could come from that. So. Right, if you're comparing to the sun, then the sun is orbiting a much slower rotation rate than these sunlight stars. Right, yes. So it is tidally synchronized, and so the, the rotation rate is should be faster. And we did try to look at the effects of rotation, like uh, mixing and stuff like that that could happen, which um, preliminary results show that it's not um, having a significant effect, at least um, with the MESA models. But um, there could be more complex effects that's happening. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, people can hear? Good? Great. Awesome. All right, so um, my name is Katie Brevik. I'm visiting from the Flatiron Institute. Um, in fall, in a few short months, I'll be headed to Carnegie Mellon. That's the one not in California. It's the one in Pittsburgh. Um, if you're uh, going to be applying for postdocs sometime soon, please let me convince you why Pittsburgh is actually a really killer place to um, do a postdoc. Top reason, you can buy a house. So <laughs> start there. Good. OK, there's also other reasons, too, that I could tell you more about later. Um, OK, so I'm going to be talking. This is, a, this is a talk that is, I have a hammer, and I'm looking for nails. That's what the point of this talk is. Um, as motivation, I'm a person who's stoked about binary stars. You already saw this slide if you were at the colloquium. But if you didn't, um, I posit that you should care about binary stars. That's it. If you don't, you're going to soon. It, they're going to become a limiting noise source for you. If you really genuinely think binary stars are useless, I would love to talk to you because I bet you we can find at least a tacit connection. <laughs> like I've done this for a few years and it's always kind of fun. OK, so the title of the talk is Backward Population Synthesis. For you to understand what backward population synthesis is, I'm going to go very quickly into what forward population synthesis is. Um, the idea here is uh, at least for binary population synthesis. When you forward model, you use binary evolution theory. You take a code like the code I developed, Cosmic. You can also use other codes like Compass or Star Trek or whatever. You model a population of your interested sources. You compare that to a large observed population. You reinform your binary evolution theory. You try to narrow down your uncertainties until you actually learn something about binary evolution theory. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but you're in luck. You have two of the world's foremost experts in forward modeling population synthesis here. One of them is Floor. Um, Floor has recently put out a paper that is like the most beautiful example of all of the forward modeling that you could possibly do for merging double compact objects. What you see on this slide is 560 models for every merging binary compact object in the universe. The different binary evolution assumptions are all the letters. The different 
uh, star formation history assumptions, which give you ages and metallicities, our vertical axes. And what Floor did was basically say, OK, we're going to model every kind of binary evolution. We're going to model every kind of star formation history. And we're going to compare to this merger rate here that's measured by ground-based gravitational wave detectors. And what Floor showed beautifully is binary black holes very, are extremely sensitive to this vertical shift. That's metallicity and star formation history. She also showed beautifully that binary evolution assumptions create these waves that are orders of magnitude and scale. So that's an idea of what you would do with forward population synthesis. You use all of the models that you could possibly think of, forward model something to compare to, in this case, observed merger rates. There's other things that you can do, too. Lika put out a beautiful paper that shows that within isolated binary evolution, different formation channels produce qualitatively and quantitatively different observables to compare to. So when we get a 1,000 mergers from third generation ground-based detectors, you can literally compare delay times, as you see here, versus black hole masses, and determine by the relative rates which of these parameters fits. That's the idea with forward model population synthesis. I love it. I also do it. I do it for lots of things. I don't have time for that uh, in this talk. Um, what motivated us to think a little bit differently uh, was actually a, an Aspen workshop uh, where we got together a bunch of people to say, where did the black holes come from? And we had people from the dynamical formation channels where you dynamically put black holes together. You can put them together lots of times. This can be in globular clusters, galactic centers, whatever. Or there's isolated binaries. Um, Floor did a poll that was one of the most like, sad things that, that's ever happened to me in my career, which was she said, in 30 years, what will we know? Will we know where the black holes come from? And like the unanimous answer from the whole workshop was absolutely not. And so we were like, what are we doing? <laughs> like, what are we doing here? I don't understand. Um, so we went to like the weird Aspen bar um, that you go to that you can afford because <laughs> we're not like millionaires. Um, and myself and Kay Zwong and Will Farr decided what if instead of thinking about formation channels, we go backwards. And so we say, let's take an observed thing, model the hell out of it, and then see if it tells us something about binary evolution. Um, the idea that we took and ran with was actually pioneered by Jeff Andrews. And the idea here is you, instead of um, forward modeling a whole population, you pick a source. In this case, that's GW150914. Of course, that's the first one you do. It's the first binary black hole merger. Um, and you actually just Monte Carlo sample over all possible initial conditions. So Jeff mapped out every way within a binary evolution model you could make a 150914. There are two channels that you see that primarily come out. Good, fine. This is what he did. There's something that really bothered us. And it's that if you look at the LIGO posterior, the binary evolution doesn't cover it all the way. The orange and the blue don't cover the gray. And we were like, ah, that's because Jeff picked one binary evolution model. So we extended it with our tool called Backpop. And now we map gravitational wave events onto initial parameters, but we actually also let our binary evolution flags change too. So this is like literally any way that you could make a binary ever. What, what is that with GW150914? Um, this paper that we put out was uh, basically like a proof of concept, like does this work? Because you would think the dimensional space is way too high. The answer is it is unless you're careful about the sampling. I don't have time to talk about that. But if you're interested, we have the paper. Um, what we found is that it's a really valuable tool. So 150914 is actually really easy to make. That is uh, reference or like seen because we don't have really strongly measured parameters here, right? Like there's a lot of like the whole square <laughs> is filled in with colors. Um, but there are some things that we uh, are really, really stoked about. And the one that I really want to highlight is 
if you can see this direct vertical line at M2 equals 80 versus the accretion efficiency, that is something that we saw on the table and we were like, oh, what's happening there? Why are we not measuring this at all? And the answer is actually because at 80 ZAMS mass for secondaries, they preferentially pick 80 ZAMS mass primaries. Those systems go into only common envelopes and therefore you don't measure the accretion efficiency. So by doing this, we've just like totally mapped out a channel without even thinking about it. So we were like, okay, this is probably cool. Um, we did a proof of concept where we looked like at a parameter versus the mass. This is very like hand wavy higgledy piggledy. So I'm gonna get to what I actually think is very exciting um, and where we were able to really use this tool quickly and ascertain physics rapidly. And that was, uh, used in Kareem's recent discovery of Gaia black hole one. So I have predicted that Gaia will find tons of these things. When Kareem found it, I was like, yes, <laughs> like this is amazing. I'm so stoked about this. It's a beautiful black hole. Like there's no way that it's not a black hole. Kareem sent me these parameters and was like, how do you make this with a binary? And I was like, oh, I'll tell you, I can model every single way. And so we did that. And we immediately started running into problems, like immediately. And I was like, oh no. Um, so the first thing that we found to map onto Gaia BH1 is that uh, the zero age main sequence mass ratio is completely insane, 71 to 0.9. Like that has never been observed. The uh, contraction onto the main sequence lifetime, like the whole black hole progenitor went through its whole life, did whatever before this G star contracted onto the main sequence. So we were like, uh oh, like, I don't know. Um, and then we looked at the binary evolution physics and that's where things got really bad. Um, so the way that you would make Gaia BH1 is that you have a big, in this case, 70 solar mass star. It evolves off the main sequence, it fills its Roche lobe, it goes into something called a common envelope, where you basically take your initial orbital energy, you dump it into unbinding the envelope of this star, and then you get a final orbital energy that determine, is determined by the orbital period. This efficiency was 13 times the size of the orbit. So we were like, cool, we didn't make one. <laughs> like, it didn't work. Um, we're excited because we actually were able to model the kicks well. Uh, and it worked, but the punchline was we were basically within an afternoon able to rule out isolated binaries as the formation of Gaia BH1. Um, ooh, wait, I don't want to do this. It's fine, whatever. Uh, so this was a good example of this, and what I'm here trying to figure out is if everyone else, anyone else has binaries for us to hit this, uh, hit with this hammer, because we're pretty stoked about it, and I would really like to have one that actually is from binaries instead of from something else that we don't understand. And that's all. Thanks. So Katie, you mentioned that at Aspen everyone was pessimistic that in 30 years we would not really know. Um, but that obviously precludes uh, electromagnetic counterparts because they could help us, right? And did anyone think about a way of, you know, using LS esteem in combination with the gravitation wave detector? And I mean, maybe there is some electromagnetic signal somewhere if it comes like from a galactic nucleus. You know? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that there is there is something to be optimistic about, surely. And yes, like people are. Uh, definitely planning for uh, EM counterparts to binary black holes with LSST. Like, of course you have to look. You would, it would be very dumb not to look. Um, in the 90 that we found so far, they don't seem to work very well, except for the one, 190521, that's maybe tacit. So we'll see, I mean, maybe when we have a thousand, that will help. I think the real formation channel the thing that will be a huge game changer is getting red shifts, but that's third generation. So we'll see. You mean from gravitational waves? Yeah. Right, but that's what I'm saying. If, if we can't imagine something that nature does, which would uh, produce uh, for LSST a signal that we currently cannot detect because there is no survey that deep, 
Right. That would change the game. And then you can be more optimistic. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, we can be, there's reasons to be optimistic. I spent the whole colloquium telling people to be optimistic. So I hope that there's reasons. But yeah, yeah. That's, sure. Yeah. Um, comments for Katie? Oh, go ahead, Chuck. So <clears throat> backward versus forward. It's the same data, it's the same basic physical models. So in principle, I feel like backward and forward should be the same. And I, in other fields, when, that, when there's a difference, it seems like it's because in one approach, you're throwing out a lot of information. Oh, yeah, OK. So like in the backwards case, you're using a lot of information about one thing, which is normally, I think, not included in the forward modeling yeah. like, program, even though in principle, I guess it could. So is it just a question of like how you compress the data that you're comparing to in each case? Yeah, basically. So in this case, floor models every binary black hole that there is. If you modeled every binary black hole with every single combination of parameters, this like would crash a computer to make a figure of because there's so much data to play around with. And this was already like a gargantuan library, like a uh, catalog problem basically. So for <laughs> us, like here, we literally sampled like four million different combinations of all the parameters to map that out. So it's just like, as a human, it's very hard to do that for a whole population moving forward. Well, maybe AI could yeah. help us. This might be, I don't, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't understand AI. <laughs> maybe we should just like take this figure and put it into chat GPT. <laughs> chat GPT 4. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, the four, that's right, because the three won't take the picture. But. Uh, any other comments? Thank you so much, Katie, that was very